Okay, I think everything looks good. Good evening, welcome. I'm Pastor Rick Williams, and this is Zion Lutheran Church, and it is Wednesday, October 7th. We're here for our evening prayer service. Um, tonight, we are going to be looking a little more in depth into our sermon message from Sunday in our gospel reading, uh, Matthew 21, verses 33 to 46, I believe it was. Um, it's the parable of the vineyard and the tenants, and we're going to kind of look at that a little more in depth tonight. Um, we're also going to look at um, our Old Testament reading from that same Sunday, Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 7, which is the vineyard of the Lord is judged. And we're going to do a little comparison between the, the two so we can uh, see about Jesus and what he's saying. And uh, boy, that was close. It says it almost ended. Uh, hit the wrong button. Okay, but hopefully we're still going here. I'm going to try and move it along tonight in case any of you wish to go watch the uh, vice presidential debate. Why does it keep doing that? All right, he's still there. Twice now it has jumped out and said that it's going to end the video, and I'm not sure why it did that. Hmm. But anyway, as I was saying, I was going to try and keep it short tonight. In case anybody wanted to go watch the vice presidential debates, um, personally, I've got them set to record so I can watch them later if I can bring myself to do it. Um, and if you want to go watch the debates, you can do that. You can always watch me later because you can catch this service anytime. Um, you can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on our um, the church's website. You can watch it here on Facebook. You can also watch it on the Zion Lutheran app. So we have lots of resources for you. Um, tonight we, uh, let's see, don't have a lot of announcements. Actually, I think the only announcement I have up here, look at that. We'll be having drive up communion Sunday, October 18th. So uh, please join us for that. Um, I know with the uh, increase in the uh, COVID numbers and stuff, people are wanting to stay home and do their best to avoid the contagion. And I certainly respect that and understand that. So um, if you want to watch from home and then just come join us Sunday afternoon, the eight or Sunday morning after the worship service for communion, that'd be great. Um, we just drive up and, and, and commune you right there in your car. Um, prayer list tonight. We have a couple of things going on. Um, we've got Robert Hagee, Vi Basney, James Fletcher, Brad Campbell, Dan Schick. We've got Patrick and Gary, Alice Balmer. Um, I was also asked just a few minutes before the service started to add Tenna and Kim. Um, I'm not sure what's going on there, but we certainly will add them to the prayer list. And then uh, we had Dylan Andrew Roy, my newest grandson on the list, because he was at, uh, Children's and United Hospital in St. Paul, and praise the Lord, he was released today from the hospital, and he is now home with mom and dad. So uh, we thank the Lord for that and ask him to continue to watch over that new young family. We're also praying this evening for the family of Donna Graves. Panna, Dana, da, boy, Donna passed away last uh, week, and her funeral service uh, for immediate family will be held this Friday uh, here at Zion. There is a visitation from 10 until 11 if you would like to come and pay your respects uh, to the family. There, and there will also be an internment at the cemetery in Bayfield at, oh boy, I believe it's 3 o'clock. Let me look here. I think I have the, oh, 2.30 says a 2.30 burial service is planned at the Greenwood Cemetery in Bayfield. Um, and that's open to all because we can certainly social distance out there. And it's supposed to be a gorgeous day on Friday. So the sun will be shining on that, we pray. Anyway, um, that's what I have. My opening scene or my opening verse uh, this afternoon or this evening, I uh, was kind of looking for one. 
wasn't sure uh, what what it was going to be. Good evening, Sandy. Uh, wasn't sure what it was going to be. And then once, lo and behold, I got an email and this one popped in. And I thought it was pretty appropriate, especially considering the things that are going on in our world today. So here's our verse for tonight. But I will sing of your strength in the morning. I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. That comes from Psalm 59, verse 16. I believe that's one of David's psalms. Um, David, like we, um, certainly had times of trouble. And uh, so we pray for the Lord to... Uh, watch over us and keep us in his care during our times of trouble. With that being said, I think I'm going to slide right into the service. Um, as always, we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation and we, your creatures. Glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, our opening reading this evening comes from the Old Testament, comes from the prophet Isaiah, probably one of the most read prophets of all of the prophets, also one of the longest prophets, um, but uh, probably why it's first. Anyway, uh, we're reading Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Isaiah writes, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I look for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove the hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, the epistle reading for Sunday came from Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, chapter 3, beginning with verse 4b. Paul writes, if anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count 
as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attend the resurrection, attain, pardon me, the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this, obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Our gospel reading indeed comes from Matthew chapter 1, verses 33 to 46. It's aptly called the parable of the tenants in the vineyard. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in its in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? Pardon me, my screen jumped. I don't know what's going on here tonight. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in his eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when, he fall, when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. All right. Now, um, I'm hoping that you noticed some similarity between Isaiah and between uh, Jesus' parable in the gospel. You know, many of Jesus' parables often parallel readings from the Old Testament. That's one of the things that makes the Old Testament so important. In order to see Jesus as the fulfillment of scriptures, we have to see where these things overlap. Where are the um, prophecies of Jesus? Where has he fulfilled them? Um, when we look at that original Isaiah reading, there are a few differences um, in, in the Isaiah reading. God has built the vineyard. That's clear. 
Um, one of the things that we found as we've been reading about vineyards, we had them uh, last week, we had them the week before uh, with the two sons that were asked to go work in the vineyard. One of the things we need to make sure we understand is, is the vineyard is the kingdom of God. And in the reading from Isaiah, we are understanding that God has prepared that kingdom. He, he put a fence around it. Well, he built a hedge, which is a fence. He, he dug it up. He cleared the stone. He planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it. And he hewed out the wine vat. I was I was checking into the wine vat. It was kind of interesting. Those things were actually quite large, and they were usually hewn right into the uh, to the bedrock stone. And they had um, two uh, levels. The top level was shallow and much bigger and rounded, and then it actually had a little runoff trough that went down into another vat that was bigger, deeper. Uh, deeper, not necessarily wider, but deeper, more round. And the upper vat that was kind of flattened is where they would throw all the grapes and then they would go walk on them and smash them. And then the juice would run out through the trough into the bottom vat. And so those vats were very, very permanent. They weren't made to, uh, you know, be uh, removed or destroyed even. So, I mean, he, he put this, this vat in there and... Uh, Isaiah even goes further to tell us who those people were. You know, um, first he has God questioning, what more could I do for the vineyard? He wanted it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Now you might ask, what are wild grapes? Wild grapes were not good for making wine. They weren't as sweet. They were sour. They were bitter. Um, so they did not make good wine. That's why it was important to dress and keep your uh, your uh, vineyard trimmed and well maintained and watered and all of those things. Because if you didn't, then you got the little sour, bitter, uh, wild grapes. And here the Lord is saying, I, I built this beautiful vineyard. I cared for it. I did everything for it that I possibly could. Why is it coming up with these wild grapes? And uh, so then what he says is, hey, I'm going to get rid of this vineyard. And uh, he also tells us in verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. In this instance, that, that kingdom of God is Israel itself. And he's talking about Israel and how he made Israel. And he brought them out of Egypt and he set them into the promised land. And he did everything for him. And they continued to go astray. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. The people fell away. They worshiped false gods. They did all kinds of abomination. And what happened to the vineyard that was Israel? Well, when Babylon came, Jerusalem, which is the seat of power of Israel, was destroyed. The wall was torn down. The fence, the, the fence around Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were led into exile. So now we come to Jesus' parable. And, you know, if we start out, the first thing Jesus said is, here another parable. I guess it kind of makes us wonder, you know, he's been talking for a while here. If you go back through the scripture, we're separated by weeks, but this is all going on in a day. Um, this is, as I mentioned Sunday, it's Tuesday of Holy Week. Um, Jesus is three days from his death, and he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And, you know, it's almost like when he says this, that they're maybe getting tired of listening to him, that they're going to take off. And he says, hear another parable. And then he goes into this. There was a master of the house who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press, built a tower. Well, that sounds pretty familiar to Isaiah. And I tell you that all of those chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the church, uh, the Pharisees, they would have immediately tied what Jesus is saying back to Isaiah because they read it and they read it regularly. The difference comes in when Jesus then says that the owner, the creator of the vineyard, leased it to tenants and then left. 
And when the season drew near, he sent his servants to get the fruit. In this case, what we see is God left Israel to be tended by the hierarchy. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders of the, of the church, they were supposed to watch it. They were supposed to take care of his vineyard. And when things started going badly, when the grapes started going wrong and becoming wild, what did God do? He sent his prophets. He sent men like Isaiah and all of the other prophets to warn Israel, to let them know what they were doing wrong. And what did Israel do to the prophets? Well, I can assure you that more than one of them was beaten. More than one of them was killed. And we know that more than one was stoned. He killed them. And you can also bet that these chief priests and Pharisees who were listening to this parable recognized what Jesus was talking about. And it says, again, he sent other servants more than the first. Towards the end, before Babylon, there were a number of active prophets. Um, Isaiah was out there. Jeremiah was out there. A um, there, bunch of prophets were out prophesying, trying to help Israel see the error in its ways. And Israel did not listen to them. And then Jesus comes up with the final thing, the tenants. The, the uh, owner of the vineyard says, I will send my son and they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Jesus is telling these chief priests, these scribes, the Pharisees, those that are listening to him, that he knows what they want to do to him. He knows what they're planning to do to him. He's admitting what's going to happen to him. He knows what's coming. And we know that it's fulfilled because not only did they kill him, but they didn't do it in Jerusalem. They took him out side the city to that place called Golgotha, the skull, and they crucified him there. And what does it say? They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. And then he puts the question back to the chief priests and the Pharisees. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And it says, they said to him, now that they is the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and those that were questioning Jesus and listening to Jesus and wanting to kill Jesus. They said, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. And then Jesus says a line here that I think kind of sums up a lot of it. He says to them, have you never read in the scriptures? And then he goes on to quote another Isaiah quote. It says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is a marvelous and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. And then verse 545 tells us, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, in their infinite wisdom, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they hailed him to be a prophet. They knew. They knew he was talking about him. There's some things I don't think they realized when Jesus is talking about taking away the kingdom. He's going to be taking the kingdom away when he takes the vineyard away, we're taking the kingdom of God away. 
from you and it'll be given to a people producing fruits. Those people producing fruits are going to be those few Jews who did follow Jesus and the Gentiles, that whole new people, the ones that Paul is going to go preaching to. It's kind of interesting in a single generation that Christianity went be from being a religion of converted Jews to a religion of a majority of Gentiles. They went out into the f world to accomplish this. Um, it was, uh, you know, the, one of the things that I had a note on here, it says Isaiah aimed to preach at the Jews in general. When we go back to Isaiah 5, Isaiah is preaching to all of Israel, the Jews, everybody that's in Israel. When Jesus starts preaching about the vineyard, he has now become more selective. He is preaching directly to the hierarchy. Those who are in charge of the nation of Israel, those who have, that have led the people of Israel astray, astray, have stopped them from producing fruit have caused them to be the wild fruit. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, we see that the, we know that the, that the landowner's son is obviously Jesus. We've talked about that. He's telling the scribes and the, the chief priests and the Pharisees that, that, hey, I know what you want to do. I'm the son you won't admit it. You know it. You've heard it, but you won't believe it because you don't want to give up your position. But I am the son and you're going to try and kill me and you are going to kill me for this inheritance. And uh, what's interesting in this, this, uh, this story, this parable is in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Luke, the parable of the owner, the owner of the vineyard, when the owner is saying, I'm going to send my son, he says, my son, whom I love. And what's really interesting is we see that echoing God's voice, the father's voice, first at Jesus' baptism, way back in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And then we also hear that same voice in uh and the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, 5. This is my son. Listen to him. They don't want to hear him. They don't want to believe in him because they are so set in their ways. You know, we hear it over and over. They say, we have Father Abraham. Yeah, but what, what did they say? Even uh, God could make, turn these rocks into, into believers if he wanted. Um, you know, and the other thing, I guess, that's kind of interesting. I thought there was, there's something maybe just, you know, I don't know if I want to use the word unreal in the story that, that Jesus tells in the parable. You know, I guess the question is, how likely would the father have been to send his son into this situation um, knowing that the two times before that most of whom he'd sent had been killed, you know? And, uh, but I think part of that is to help us reflect on the idea and to help illustrate the incredible patience of God. It's mind-boggling for us in, in our human minds to understand how or why God would send his son into the world after he'd seen how his people had treated the prophets. It's the same way we wonder how the landowner could send his son after he'd seen how the other servants were, were treated. God knows what the people of Israel did to the prophets. 
He knows what they're going to do to his son. But he does it anyway. Because he does it out of love for you and for me. It's why he does it. And, uh, you know, it's it's interesting, I think, to, as we think about that, that God sacrificed his son to reclaim his vineyard. And I've been kind of preaching on it for the last couple of weeks. We're actually going to be moving on a little bit next week. That vineyard, that kingdom of God, right now, this very moment, you and I are part of that kingdom. We are part of God's kingdom. And in order to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of his vineyard, he wants us to be fruitful. And how do we be fruitful? We've been talking about that for a few weeks too. Or actually a whole lot longer than that in one way or another. We are fruitful by sharing and spreading the word of God. By letting others know what it takes to come work in that vineyard. And the work's not hard. But the reward's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. We need to share that message with those around us, particularly in this world today. This world today, I think you would all agree with me, is pretty lost. It's struggling. It has no real direction. Everyone is searching. Searching for a way to cope, searching for a way to get by, searching for an understanding of why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? We have the answers to all of those questions. We can help people to see that, to make it through that, to strengthen them, to strengthen each other, to strengthen us. The more and more people that we can bring into the vineyard, that we can bring into the Lord's church, not only lift them up, but it lifts us up. We need to lift each other up, to bring ourselves up out of the depths and to do the very best we can to bear fruit in the Lord's vineyard as we work in that vineyard until he either calls us home or returns for the final harvest. Either way, we need to be ready for it. So, if you ever see some grapes, check them out. Are they good grapes or wild grapes? Don't be a wild grape. Be a good grape. And then you too can spend eternity in the kingdom of God. Can't ask for much more than that. Anyway, I think I'm going to close with that. Um, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, uh, please feel free to uh, let me know. Give me a call. Shoot me a text. Message me on Facebook. Um, I'm always happy to hear from you and uh, I look forward to it. So may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, normally in the prayer service, this is where we'd have the offering. i just like to take a moment to thank you for all of your gifts, for all of your stewardship. And remind you, you can, you can drop your envelope in the mailbox. You can mail it to us. Um, you can uh, give using the app. Um, there are a number of ways, and uh, please, uh, once again, thank you so much for your stewardship and for helping us keep these doors open and the lights on and the internet running and, and the heat going now um, with all of your gifts and offerings. Uh, thank you for that. Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, 
for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew, our synodical president, Dwayne, our district president, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Donald, our president, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present, both in the sanctuary and there on the internet, for all of us who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those with special concerns and needs this day, those who are ill or in the hospital, including Robert and Vi, James and Brad, Dan and Patrick, Gary and Alice, Tenna and Kim, Lord, we also thank you for watching over Dylan and allowing him to come home from the hospital today. We also pray for all of those who grieve. This day we pray for the family of Donna Graves. We also pray for those who are unemployed or underemployed, the chronically ill and shut in, and all others whose needs are not known to us at this time. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord, to you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. My friends, once again, thank you for joining me this evening. And I close now with the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and to give you peace. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, have a blessed evening, a blessed week. Uh, join us on Sunday if you have the opportunity. And once again, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, or would just like to talk, please uh, feel free to get a hold of me. Uh, be safe. Be healthy. See you soon. God bless. And good night.